Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second session with um, Matt Sigelman, the CEO of Burning Glass Technologies, a leading labor, uh, labor market analytics firm. Um, Matt is um, um, a member of our advisory board for NYU um, Human Capital Analytics and Technology Program. And we're very, um, very happy to have him here today to uh, talk to us about labor force analytics. Uh, Matt, without further ado, please jump in. Anna, such a pleasure. And I think, um, I think somebody has to allow me to start my video camera. Um, Hello. Ah, there we go. Fantastic. Um, I don't know if it's fantastic for you guys or not that you can see me. Um, oh, well, <laughs> that's kind of groovy. Um, let's try to do that again. Um, let's see. Still groovy. Oh, wow. Okay. We're going to do this one more time. And then sometimes you reset the camera. I've, this happened once or twice before. And it goes from pink to, um, to looking like the Wicked Witch of the West, um, that is to say all green. Um, well, we'll just deal with it. Um, this will be the grooviest session of the day and, um, and we're the most wicked. Um, there we go, now we're, we're to wicked. Um, and um, I am, uh, we're gonna make everyone else green with envy. Um, it's such a pleasure to be together and I am uh, excited for this chance to, to share with you some of what we've seen about um, how to apply um, new data sets to being able to drive, uh, to be able to respond to the imperative of the day around building um, diversity and, or, and inclusion within organizations. I'm gonna take a, uh, I'm, I'm going to um, take you some data and some approaches um, that we've been using to drive some of our work based on, uh, on the deep uh, data and analytics that we're able to undertake around the market. Um, and uh, I've got my email address here. There's a lot of data here. And so feel free to email me or find me on LinkedIn or whatever. And I'll be glad to send a copy of these slides. Um, Burning Glass's perspective uh, on diversity and inclusion is informed by the work that we do um, as the global authority on talent and skills um, by developing um, you know, just really robust data and, and rich taxonomies um, on, uh, on the job market uh, across the world. Um, that allows us to um, see changes that are happening, but also to understand the skill genome of talent pools. Um, obviously, uh, we all know about talent shortage. We know that um, this is becoming an overall um, uh, difficult problem, uh, increasingly difficult problem. I, I would just sort of want to, though, ask us to step back because I think we tend to think about uh, right now are having um, two problems. You know, we're trying to respond on the one side to a uh, increasingly talent short world. Um, and then unfortunately, I think a lot of us perceive um, the problem responding to the today's challenge of diversity as a compounding problem. Um, and in fact, we see them, uh, we see them not as two problems that compound, um, but rather um, as uh, a problem with a, uh, with a solution to it. Um, and that is to um, more successfully leverage town pools that we're not already seeing. Now, a lot of what is driving this, of course, is that we know that um, skills are changing very fast. So there's significant mismatches going on. We're seeing that accelerate through the pandemic. Um, here's sets of jobs that literally have had, you know, uh, just over the space of last year, really dramatic changes in terms of the sets of skills um, that they are requiring in terms of how they define themselves. And so that only exacerbates some of the problems that we're seeing. Um, I may be showing you the uh, wrong, just give me one second here. Um, no, I'm not. Um, okay, well, in any case, um, I'll just uh, go back in there for a second. Sorry about that. Uh, and what's also sort of compounding that is that we're seeing um, key macro trends that um, are around uh, the logistics economy, the green economy, the remote economy, the automated economy that are, that are um, together are gonna be creating about uh, 18 million new jobs. So on top of everything else that's making things hard, we've got a lot of new jobs that are gonna require new skills that we need to fill. Um, 
Now, all of that is currently um, compounding the equity gap. Uh, about uh, a year ago, well, about a year and a half ago, we started doing work uh, with PolicyLink and J.P. Morgan Chase, um, analyzing um, the uh, issues of workforce equity we can see in our data, um, and then the pandemic happened, and so we can see both um, existing in, uh, inequities in the market, but also how they get ex exacerbated through the pandemic. Um, but as I was saying, that notion that hey, we've got this talent short world, and uh, on the other hand, we have an imperative of equity aren't two problems, but a single one, um, and one that has a solution to it. So what I'd like to do today is to lay out um, six key principles to uh, how we can resolve this challenge. Um, uh, first, uh, in being able to um, be more effective at how we track representation um, and more granular and more dimensionalized in that tracking than, um, than most organizations have been able to be. Um, in our being able to set goals in a way that's data informed and benchmarked in a very granular and uh, company and location specific way about our being able to um, challenge hiring assumptions to be able to look at new sources of talent that we've been overlooking, both externally, but also internally by building the right pathways. Um, and then it's also by a really kind of thinking about what are the metrics of inclusion and making sure that we're including those as well. And of course, finally, how do we make sure that leaders um, have that, that people analytics is in service to broad and, and has attention from executive leadership. So one of the first things I'll talk about is the idea of tracking representation. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have found is that most organizations are tracking or representation at a very high level. Um, you know, here is on the left uh, from the diversity census from a, a, a very large uh, Fortune 50 company, uh, which, um, you know, if you look at their perspectives, they would say, perspectives, they would say, you know, look where uh, our, our company is 45% uh, Black or Latinx, um, which seems to be, you know, uh, have quite good representation. Um, but when you actually delve into, we look in our data about, uh, you know, their employees and, and uh, the representation of various categories of work, um, once you look outside of, uh, for example, distribution and logistics functions, um, you see much, much less uh, diversity data scientists, only uh, 2% uh, of that company's data scientists are Black or Latinx. Um, and so being able to look underneath um, and be able to understand where, uh, where we see this, uh, that representation where we don't is really critical. Um, sunlight's the best disinfectant. And being able to um, look across functions and understand um, and, and look across roles and look across locations and look across business units, um, that may seem obvious. I know uh, many of us in this call are, are people analytics, uh, are deep, deeply involved in the world of people analytics. It seems obvious that you'd want to be able to dimensionalize things. But the reality is, is that um, typically um, that kind of uh, granularity is missing from the report of DEI data. Now, part of why it's so important to get that granular is because we wanna be able to benchmark um, and to actually have key metrics of processes that we can be more effective at setting our goals. When it comes to goal setting, um, most of us, uh, most organizations tend to suffer from uh, a, uh, a two, too wide, uh, either a too broad or too narrow problem, right? So we either say, hey, we want all of our workers uh, to uh, um, represent uh, the America we serve, um, which sounds right. It's the right goal. It is the right goal. But um, at the end of the day, as you can see, a lot of talent pools um, have uh, very different um, uh, dynamics. And, and you know, that has to inform how this works. Um, also, at the same time, um, it's easy to just look very narrowly and say, hey, well, I'm a tech company, for example, and, you know, it's just not a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, hard to find, uh, um, you know, uh, Black or Latinx workers in, in the world of tech, so I guess we're doing fine. Uh, well, as you can see here, is sort of looking at um, a selection of Fortune 50 companies, and you can see uh, for their software developers, they range from 
two percent. Um, a lot of tech companies, um, uh, um, you know, who are uh, you know the Fangs, for example, all in the kind of mid single digit percentage of their software developers are, are black or Latinx, um, and other Fortune fifty companies were almost thirty percent. Um, of their software developers uh, are Black or Latinx. And so that's about when you have those benchmarks, you can then say, wait a second, okay, no, it's not just that we're in the world of tech or we're hiring software developers. Actually, we could do better and we can push ourselves to do better. Um, and, and I think, you know, having in the past those kinds of really company specific benchmarks have been existed, um, they do now. And, and, you know, we've been finding as we've been delivering those um, that it's made a huge um, difference. Part of this is also about challenging assumptions um, about where we can find talent. Um, you know, here's an example. Uh, a lot of uh, roles continue to require a college degree. Um, this is looking at support specialists, for example, on an IT help desk. Um, if you look here, so okay, if you look at jobs that require a college degree and those that don't, um, the skills look I don't know about you, but to me, they look pretty similar. Um, and so there's a few differences um, that are trainable and then that don't necessarily correlate with a college degree. And so looking at those kinds of things that may be creating barriers um, is important. So continuing to evaluate requirements. It's also about continuing to uh, evaluate, are there other ways that we can access pools of talent? Um, here's an example of, of location dynamics. Uh, again, the left will go back to software developers. Um, you know, if you're uh, a if you're one of the fangs and you're based in Silicon Valley uh, or Seattle, um, yep, uh, only four percent of software developers are are black or Latinx. Um, in Miami, that number is fifty five percent. Obviously, not as big a market, but a much bigger uh, pool in Atlanta. It's forty. It's thirty one percent. I think the the chart on the right, by the way, always um, just uh, um, is particularly frustrating to me. Um, you know, on on the left, at least, you know, we do know that different cities have different uh, racial distributions and 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 the like. But I think most cities have a pretty balanced um, gender distribution, and yet you can see um, that the gender distribution of work and workers in different cities um, have profoundly different uh, views. So, for example, fin financial analysts. In New York, are only thirty-five percent uh, women. Um, in a whole bunch of other cities, it's much closer to fifty percent, um, and those are very different swings. And that unlocks our ability to try to find talent more broadly. But it's also about trying to find pools of talent, and again, having that skill-based view of the world allows us to say, are there ways that we can stretch our job definitions to um, encourage different thinking? Uh, on the right, you're seeing actuaries. Uh, and I use that example because actuaries, um, the not so fun fact for the morning, um, they are the whitest job in America. Um, they are uh, only 5% Black or Latino. Um, and uh, you know, most of the people working, uh, and, and uh, it's a job that hasn't um, changed all that much in, in quite a while. Um, risk managers aren't usually diverse, but 14% compares favorably to 5%. And as you can see, there's some clear skill overlaps. Um, and so when you define those overlaps and then say, um, here's the skills that a risk manager would need to accrue in order to become an actuary, you've unlocked a potential pool of talent. And so you can um, start to look for uh, and tap pools you haven't been thinking about. That is equally true internally as externally. Um, all companies have um, have uh, um, pools of talent that are uh, reservoirs for diversity, and they have droughts of diversity. We recently did fascinating analysis that we plan to be bringing out in the next uh, couple of months, um, but I'll share with you what we found. I mean, it's this. Um, when you look across the uh, representation um, uh, across roles um, in the Fortune 100, for example, what you find is that company by company um, and very consistently that you would expect a distribution. I love talking to an analytics audience because you guys will get this, right? You expect a distribution function generally to most often look like a bell curve. Um, what we found is that in this case, distribution of representation across a company is actually a U-shaped curve. Um, there are 
most roles are either total droughts of diversity or they're talent ghettos. And there's very few roles in between. Um, and so um, what that says is, is that you need to be able to identify where, where are those droughts, where are those reservoirs and be able to start thinking, taking a skill-based approach that changes the game in some pretty profound ways because it says that we're not just dependent on, um, on you know, kind of the fixed pool of talent that's already working in a role, but we can actually um, build to diversity. We can create talent es uh, escalators within the organization. Operations coordinators, for example, in this example are, uh, are only 20% uh, people of color, shipping clerks, uh, are twice as likely to, to be people of color, you know, people of color are overrepresented in those jobs. But there's a very clear step-by-step -step skill track that will move shipping clerks into operations coordinators, enable them to earn more and significantly grow diversity. And these kinds of arbitrage opportunities, if you will, uh, to be able to take talent from pools that are highly diverse and move them into ones where we're starved for diversity exists across every company. Uh, you know, take this example here uh, of a, uh, a large Fortune 50 retailer where database admins, DBAs are 21% Black or Latinx, data engineers only 4%. Can you make that transition? You can. Um, and, and every company has those, but we have to be looking for them. And then that allows us to line up L&D to close those gaps. Finally, I want to, uh, you know, speak about the importance of uh, being able to empower leaders uh, to be able to have access to these kinds of insights um, that they can kind of really visually see where there are opportunities. This is a, uh, a great example here. Uh, what you're seeing in this small chart is looking at it in a benchmarked way, um, but also at a staged way based on EEO levels how diverse, um, in this case, gender diverse, each uh, pool of talent is. And you can see in this particular organization, you go from, um, you know, fairly, you know, not a great bench, but a, um, at least in a benchmark way, companies sort of middle of the road um, from non-exempt, for individual contributors, for managers, um, and then huge fall off um, at the executive level. Uh, that's a company which, uh, you know, can clearly look and say, wait a second, our problem is not that we need to recruit more into the executive level. We have a bench of talent and we're not promoting it. Those kinds of visualizations um, can be very, very useful um, in uh, being able to uh, identify uh, and help leaders to make, to drive to change. Um, the, I also want to talk about um, this idea of inclusion. Uh, as we all know, uh, are, we can't just bring representation into the organization. We need to make sure that everyone feels welcome, um, everyone feels empowered and productive. Um, and that's, that's really where rubber meets the road. Um, most metrics of retention to date have really been about um, uh, questions of, of frankly, uh, of uh, various kinds of um, attitude surveys and, and the like, uh, pulse checks. Uh, and those are very important. Um, but maybe not quite um, sufficient. Um, and you know, we believe that in fact, there are good metrics of retention that, of reclusion rather that um, tend to be overlooked. Um, and those are about retention and mobility. If, I'm, if, if some of my groups are moving out of the organization faster than others, I de facto have an inclusion problem. Um, and so these become very good um, uh, um, ways of being able to target where do I deploy um, the, uh, the surveys that I'm doing and, and that tend to have really relatively low response rates. Here's just sort of uh, an example of how this plays out. Um, and we can see it in our data. Um, you know, uh, here, uh, uh, black employees are represented in orange, um, white are in blue. And you can see um, a number of companies where actually have positive dynamics where um, uh, black employees are more likely to stay than majority peers. Um, and then other companies where you're seeing the exact opposite, um, some significant material differences uh, with black employees um, more likely to leave. And then some organizations which uh, are just challenged altogether. Um, and so it's just looking at a, a selection of, of tech companies, we can see these kinds of things bear out. 
Um, and then you can start to get more granular and say, okay, but in what departments and how does this vary throughout an organization? Um, and so um, when we can have those more refined metrics, we can really get to a place where we can drive change. Data provides an evidence base. In a time when we have, when every organization is working to respond to uh, the imperative of inclusion, uh, we need to make sure that as, in the world of people analytics, we are um, creating the evidence base that highlights um, best practice, that's um, putting focus on, on what needs to change, it's identifying barriers, um, and helping us set, the, uh, set actionable goals. Um, when we do that, we can truly grow the pie um, and move out of a zero sum game way of thinking. Um, put my email address here in case anyone wants my slides, but um, I hope we have a few minutes to take some questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Matt. That was um, a lot of information for us to process. Um, and we do have a couple of questions here. Um, the question number one, um, I would um, uh, refer to the current dynamic in the economy where you are seeing shortages, significant shortages of talent. Are you seeing any trends where the companies are going to be looking at what you exactly pointed out to and described as identifying those uh, talent potential talent pools and creating much more dynamic mobility within the talent pool? Because at the end of the day, you know, if the hiring is going to be so difficult, how are companies even going to approach their goals that, that they're setting for themselves? So um, uh, yes, we are seeing a lot more companies today starting to take a, um, a broader view um, and to realize that the best routes to building a diverse workforce lie within. Um, it's so hard to recruit today. Um, we all know that. Um, and when you think about those dynamics I mentioned before, where you know, most organizations have a very uneven spread um, of diversity. Um, they're actually quite diverse within, uh, quite uh, absent in diversity from without. That is a huge opportunity. The ability to bridge between, though, depends on having a good skill map of an organization. Um, because that's where you can say, wait a second, um, I've got uh, one of the examples I had, I think, up on the screen earlier was uh, a company where we saw a large Fortune 50 tech company where um, their, uh, their systems analysts are, um, and I'm going to get the number slightly off, but I want to say it was about 30% Black or Latinx, and then their BI analysts are only 8%. We can see that as an opportunity precisely because we understand the skill definition of each of those. And you can see the skill overlap, and you can see what are the bridges that need to be crossed. And so, you know, uh, part and parcel of building from within um, of, of creating um, escalators for diversity from within is um, recognizing that uh, L&D needs to be, if it's, um, if it's driven by data, L&D can be a core engine for diversity inside an organization. So what we're hearing is that you're advocating for also expanding and investing in the people analytics function in your organization because um, otherwise, you know, all the tools you recommended, they will have to be run in processes by experts who actually understand that. And that's not how the majority of uh, DNI or even LD organizations are set up. I that, know that's exactly work. right. I think, you know, right now, um, the, um, you know, DNI is, is not, uh, you know, is, is sort of detached from people analytics. And I think for the most part, it's um, been forced. And I think this is not by, will, but I think by construction, um, most DEI conversations are, are qualitative. And I think part of what we've struggled with in the field of DEI is that, you know, frankly, we are, uh, you know, companies are used to running on data. It's, it's the one of the, if I had to point to a single biggest transformation that most companies have undergone over the last 20 years, it's that Main Street industry is now data driven. Um, it's data driven in our supply chains and our manufacturing and, and all that. And yet when it comes to, um, you know, our, 
um, you know, one of the greatest imperatives of today, which is to grow workplace equity, um, we've been operating without any kind of evidence base. People analytics can be that evidence base. People analytics can shine the spotlight uh, on where, um, you know, there are opportunities. Um, that's such a great insight. And we actually do have a question from Lauren here, specifically of how do you recommend with the use of the tools that, um, you know, that are available to us now to focus on that uh, measuring mobility and facilitating mobility in an organization. I think you started talking about that from the mm -hmm. skills, but could you just map it out for us? Yeah, so I think there's, um, uh, I, I would measure mobility in, in the simplest way. I think, you know, first of all, you need to make sure that you have a, a sense for, I mean, I think at the most absolute level, I think you just wanna see how much um, do people uh, move within an organization? And then I think once you've got um, a good architecture of roles within an organization, you can then um, look more specifically, you can filter that to say move uh, to move up. Um, and the analysis I was showing you, we were actually looking at move up rates. Um, so looking at jobs um, that tend to be better paying or otherwise and, and understanding um, how those dynamics differ. There's actually um, also a question about the specific tools that you would recommend for organizations, or is this something that uh, com uh, smaller companies could outsource this skill set? Um, I think, you know, uh, certainly there are, there are consulting firms. I think ultimately, though, if you want to do this sustainably, you have to do this yourself. Um, and so I would be a little bit concerned about outsourcing this um, in the sense that, you know, you know we're going to wind up uh, missing a lot, of, um, a lot of the opportunities on a recurring basis. So, you know, look, um, there's a lot of new data that weren't previously available. Um, it's work that Burning Glass is central to our work um, in um, tracking skills and also tracking um, benchmarking diversity and a range of things like that. Um, so I think you want to start to look um, both at the data that's inside your HRMS as a starting point, um, but then I think you also want to, um, you know, clearly um, start to look at um, sets of data that uh, haven't that that are going to add to and bring context to the data that you can and and bring structure to the data that you can create from your own or extract from your own HRMS. Yeah, and a continuity and context as well. Just very, very last one, Matt. I know we're on the sprint here. Um, you know, you do a lot of work with higher ed and we do have quite a few of my colleagues uh, from um, educational organizations. Um, what should we do in preparing the pipeline of the specialists for the next, um, for the future of work or the present of work? Because the skill set shortage yes. is exactly uh, what our responsibility is at NYU and other, and other uh, schools. Well, Anna, I think um, you use the exact right word, which is uh, a pipeline. Uh, and one of the reasons I like that word is that it allows, it suggests that we're going to put opportunity first. Um, one of the things that's a little bit of a, um, you know, kind of uh, a cognitive uh, um, a challenge or cognitive disconnect um, in the world of education is that we're, we, as educators, um, put students first, it's what they do, it's what they should do. Um, but when you realize that education can, plays a powerful role in bridging students to opportunity and plays a powerful role in building uh, a more equitable society, um, then that says that you actually have to, um, uh, to perhaps reframe some of our thinking to be more opportunity centric. Of course, we're always going to put students first, but if we're giving equal thought to where are those opportunities, um, then you know we can work backwards from them and say, okay, how do I prepare students so that they are going to be ready to move into those opportunities and particularly focusing on those areas where we have um, seen a dearth of, of diversity. Um, one of the big opportunities and why I'm, it's such a, a um, you know an honor to serve uh, on the advisory board with with you, Anna, is that. Um, I think the, a lot of where there's the biggest opportunities are not just in, in programs that enter uh, professionals into careers, um, but those that help people transition along the way and in a world where skills are changing fast. 
Um, and so I think there's uh, putting more focus on those kinds of problems that said, those kinds of uh, programs rather, that transition workers, that transition people who are in their careers from roles where uh, uh, there's good representation to those where we need to, to break the ceiling, um, that's really powerful. Um, and creating a, a world of people analysts um, who are as diverse as the America they serve, as the world that they serve, um, is um, uh, an exciting goal and I think one we can achieve. Thank you so much, Matt. This was amazing. Uh, really a lot, of, um, a lot of great insights and um, we have recorded your session. It's going to be available and Matt is the most accessible person I've ever known with his plate being so full. Um, but thank you very much. Uh, we are moving on to our next session. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye.